Uh, All right, everyone. Let's okay. roll. Hey, welcome to get started here. Uh, welcome to the Township Committee meeting. This is a budget workshop, January 25th, 2021 via Zoom, uh, 3.30 p.m. and we're all over town. Uh, roll call, please. Mr. Brown? Here. Mrs. Patrick? Here. Ms. Holland? Here. Mr. Olette? Here. Mr. Templeton? Uh, and I'm here. Let's see, Mr. Schwaber, Township Administrator. Uh, let's see, we have Mrs. Lohr, Municipal Clerk, Mrs. Martin, Deputy Municipal Clerk, Mr. Fenimore, Superintendent of Public Works. We're expecting Chief uh, DeSanto to come in later. And we have some guests from the Delanco School District, Mr. Mersinger, Ms. LaSalle, and uh, some board members, uh, uh, Catherine Tersich Keeley, and I believe Mr. McLaughlin's also on board. Uh, did I miss anybody? Marissa's on board. Marissa right. Karamanugin. President, I'm sorry. Uh, Marissa McCarmanugin, welcome. Uh, flag salute, please. See, I brought it today. Um, I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag, flag of the United States of America, America and to, to the republic for which it stands, and one, one nation, nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Adam's here. Okay. So Adam is okay. And to amend the uh, roll call, we've got Chief uh, DeSanto is on board, and I believe Lieutenant Tilger is on, correct? Right. All right, very good. Uh, sunshine statement, Mrs. Lohr. Uh -huh. Please be advised that proper notice of this meeting has been given in compliance with the Open Public Meetings Act in the following manner. Written notice has been mailed to the Burlington County Times and Courier Post and published in the January 5th, 2021 editions. Written notice has been posted on the official bulletin to board of the Township of Delango at least 48 hours prior to the meeting. Remote meeting statement. Um, today's meeting is via the Zoom uh, remote platform, the meeting ID and passcode, um, as well as uh, other dial-in locations have been um, published on the website, published in the paper, newspaper, and also uh, on the front window as required under uh, executive order. Um, advanced public comments will be accepted via written letter or electronic mail. All advanced comments must be received no later than six hours prior to the commencement of the published public meeting start time. And they can be either sent via email or to my attention at 772 Coopertown Road, Delanco, New Jersey. And members of the public who wish to have, make comments or have questions during the meeting public comment sessions may either make their comments or questions via audio option or by typing in their comment or question via the Zoom platform chat option. Um, and finally, the agenda for this meeting is available. Uh, from the municipal clerk's office as well as on our township website as noted. And for the record mayor, um, for the advanced uh, comment section, I received no advanced comments other than various um, emails from the um, board, uh, board of education president uh, via um, some uh, presentation that they'll be making uh, today. And that is it, thank Very you. Good. Thank you. Uh, just some remarks at the beginning of this. Uh, this is a budget workshop. Uh, today we're going to be hearing from uh, the police department, the Lanco Public Works, uh, uh, Municipal Administration, and a wrap up by Mr. Schwab. Uh, I did uh, express the opportunity for the school district to present uh, some basic information on their financial position. Uh, for past years we have kind of we have considered uh, the total impact of uh, both our budgets. Uh, on the community. So I invited them uh, uh, to this session. Uh, so going into our budget pressure pre preparations for this year, we kind of have an idea and we hear we all hear the same thing from, uh, from the respected sources. So uh, there are some time slots, roughly 20 minutes or so is, is on Mrs. Lohr's agenda. That's, uh, they're soft. Uh, we may run along in some departments, a little shorter than others, but uh, it's just kind of a guideline. Uh, this is informational for the committee. Uh, the committee did receive a document package from Mr. Schwab that he's been collecting and uh, working diligently on burning midnight oil, putting that together for the last uh, six weeks or so. So um, we don't, uh, we're not making any budget decisions tonight. Uh, it's just informational, as I said, and, and uh, we're, uh, our purpose today and for the next uh, meeting or so uh, uh, 
follow on on uh, February 8th with the respective boards and commissions uh, managed by our volunteers. Uh, we're, committee is basically the sponge and absorbing all of this. So uh, um, at that this point, I'd like to open the meeting up to the public. Uh, again, we have a regular meeting next Monday. If there's some comment or question on other topics, uh, I'd ask if anyone has a question to defer uh, that's unrelated to the budget process and uh, so we can get things moving uh, today. Uh, at this point, the meeting's open to the public for comments and questions as legally required. Hearing and seeing no questions or comments from the public, I'll close the meeting to the public at this time. And uh, Mr. Schwab, do you want to open up with anything to start or do you want to just jump well, right in with uh, the result? Yeah, just to summarize what I had sent you all before and I think what everybody's seen is, uh, these are the three major uh, departments. This is the appropriation side. We will, we normally talked a little bit about the surplus and the revenue side at our February, sec our second meeting in February when you hear from all the uh, independent organizations, but uh, COVID has changed all the deadlines from the state and the annual financial statement that our auditor puts together usually is required by January 30th. So we have that data for our mid-February meeting. That has been changed. And so we anticipate having that information for our end of uh, February workshop, which is gonna be similar to this uh, at, uh, on February 22nd at 3.30. So uh, he has, he's supposed to have the AFS by March 5th. If he runs late and doesn't even have it by then, then that will probably push things off to the March uh, meeting, but we should have a pretty rough idea. So the key thing, as the mayor said, is we want to focus on the appropriations, make sure everybody understands what it takes to operate the, uh, the township at the level that we're interested in doing. Now's the time to ask detailed questions and then uh, we'll absorb more things at the February 8th meeting. And then I'll be able to put together where we ought to be along with the information the auditor gives us for the February 22nd meeting. And if that gets delayed to March, it does. The budget adoptions always run late. And so we would introduce the budget either the end of March or the beginning of April. Uh, we also have to wait for state aid numbers to be given before we can introduce. And uh, we sometimes don't uh, adopt until May. In the meantime, we run on a temporary budget. Uh, you did a three month temporary budget and we'll extend that depending on the status. So uh, we'll, we'll take a look at all that information. So based on that, I want to have let uh, John uh, tell you a little bit about his operation, uh, what you might need that's any different than in the past. And then he also, I hope you got my uh, separate uh, capital project list from him along with the debt service thing. We'll talk, I'll talk with you about later. But uh, if that makes sense, I'll let John uh, tell you about Public Works. All right, Mr. Fenimore, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Okay, floor, very good. Floor is yours. Um, uh, let's see, where, where you have the, the, the regular budget sheet. Um, it's generally, um, uh, I keep it pretty good. Uh, we've been staying under budget pretty good. Um, there's a, um, one major thing is that we have to hire another guy to replace Lester this year. So I'm just making sure that you keep that money in there. Um, I'd also, uh, for the part-time uh, in the summertime, which I don't think we got to use this year, uh, but um, I like to do that and because it's uh, very helpful to have extra guys. Um, Let's see. Uh, it's like it's it's pretty much the same. A little bit, a little bit more. Um, I can you know work with you, whatever you guys uh, come up with. Uh, you know, I'll live with it. Uh, salt, we're pretty good. Um, I put that in there just in case we do have um, some bad weather or whatever. But uh, there's plenty in in that. Uh, the road patch. Uh, we are on the decline because we're repaving new streets, which helps. Um, 
let's see, the repairs and parts, um, that's a little bit up. Um, uh, supplies and equipment, uh, that's, that's, that's up a little bit. Uh, the signs, we're doing good on the signs. Uh, I put a little bit in there. Uh, we're almost done the whole town for new signs, which we were supposed to do. That was a federal requirement, correct? Uh, the yes. The reflective yes. signs. Yep. They all have to be. And then you, what you have to do, you have to inspect them regularly. Uh, we have a lot of stop signs that we need to replace uh, so that um they're usually way more expensive than the street signs believe it or not but um uh and then all my capital john, stuff john before uh, you leave operating maybe you can yeah. explain how you handle salt because i know we order it we, we work okay. with our neighbors all right on what, that. what we what i did that. yes we have 160 tons in delran we store our main supply of salt in Doran, um, with the years, a um, couple past years, we've been doing real good on salt. So we have uh, extra salt. And I also, this year, I, I dropped off, I think, uh, 25 ton, which we have 50 ton out at Edgewater Park. Uh, we keep that out there just in case uh, we have to get out real quickly. Sometimes it's a, it's a pain in the neck because what you have to do, you have to go into Delran's garage and get their big loader and go out into the salt bin and, and load if they're not already out. So um, I have two places where we have some salt, um, which is uh, it's, it's an ideal situation for us. And um, I don't know, does anybody have any uh, questions on any of that. One of the things that I'm looking into, I'm not um, happy with our uniform people. They are terrible, and hopefully, when we switch, uh, it'll be they'll be better uniform and um, they'll be cheaper. So um, yeah, we've been getting prices on that. So yeah, we're probably ready to pull the trigger on changing that vendor. Yep. I have a, a suggestion, John, for purposes of the school board that are here, would you explain right. the number of employees that you've been working with for the past year? Um, because we really have been Six. under, actually, I mean, well, we, it's amazing uh, yeah. with everything you get done with the number of employees that we have. We have, we've had, uh, uh, we've had six, uh, but we had a guy leave for uh, a job with the county. And um, so basically, uh, the last uh, four months, we've had five guys, and that's including myself. Um, so it's, it's um, to get around the whole town and do what we need to do, um, it, it's, uh, it, it, it can get to you. But uh, we got a, a good group of guys here, and um, um, we do what we need to do, and we get things done, and, and uh, we try to get things that um, we don't usually try to get to, but uh, it's just like tree trimming. I mean, I could do a lot of tree trimming, but, I mean, it's uh, when you have other things you got to do, you got to do, and cutting, cutting grass. Uh, we did a different thing this year. I put two or three guys on at the beginning of the week, and uh, we were able to knock out, uh, instead of taking a week to get through the whole town, cutting usually takes us three days. So, and then we can, you know, move on to other things like street signs and stuff that we have to do. And uh, storm drains, uh, we got to start cleaning. Uh, also, uh, sweeping the streets. Uh, the they new DEP regulations that say that you have to sweep your streets more regular and um, I'll, I'll get in on that when I get on to my capital stuff about a sweeper. Thank you, John. Uh, this is Fern. Just a quick question. Yes. All right. So we're losing one uh, public works or we're losing another public works employee this year? Is that what we're No. 
No, we let we, we lost, lost one. one. We had six. Yes, Lester, Lester left. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thanks for that clarification. So we've only had, like I say, five guys. Thank you, um, John. That but that includes you as one of the guys, right? Yes. Yep. Okay. Um, are you ready for the capital? Yeah, go ahead. One, one more question on, on labor. So in, in looking at the worksheet here, you have a, a vacant labor and, uh, right. that amount, is that what we would hire somebody at? Yes. Yes. It seems so low. Yes. Well, well, you know, I saw somebody has a billboard on river road, a, a auto mechanic shop, thousand dollar sign on bonus. I mean, it's just, very hard to get people these days. So. Yeah. John, just so you're aware, the, the contract provides for a step system so that the starting rate is lower, but there is a three-year step system in addition to the general increase. And yes. if the person as a laborer becomes a driver, gets their commercial driver's license so they can drive the other equipment, they can move up to be a driver labor, which is the higher level. That also has a step system. So. Uh, it gives us a lot of flexibility uh, for hiring people, and that's what was agreed to in the last union contract. So it's not a we can't change that unless we negotiate a new thing in the contract, which we will be negotiating a new contract with them in 2022. 2021, I'm sorry. Okay. The, the, pro the problem being shorthand is snow season. Um, snow season can really cripple you uh, only having five guys and um uh it, it it with an extra guy it uh, it helps so much that's why we don't have any snow john that was planned yeah yes well it's because we got truck new trucks that's why yeah. <laughs> right. oh, that's the truth that's right, we the got... big reason yeah, right. Oh. That's right. We got we got new big dump truck, two smaller ones, and we got the plow on the new loader. So the difference between ten years ago and now is night and day. Yeah, night and day. The plows are so much better. The the saw spreaders are so much better. Uh, it's just uh, we haven't really even gotten out with them yet to really right. get used to them. So um, you know, we'll we'll get out there <laughs> sooner or later. Yeah, we're not, we're not having a lot things later. Crossed. <laughs> yep. No you snow. want to talk about your capital uh, items, John? Yes. Okay. The, the, one of the most important things that we have to do is uh, replace this dispenser for the fuel system. Um, now, I got this price, uh, I guess, a couple months back. So I'd have to, uh, you know, it was the 35000 What they would do, they would come in and change both of the dispensers. <laughs> and then they would put them on uh, the computer. So I wouldn't have to go out and read these things, and which is a, a real pain in the neck. And uh, uh, the system that's on there now is just so outdated, it's, uh, it's ridiculous. Just so you're aware, we'll have to negotiate with the organizations that we provide fuel to, to cover their fair share of the new system uh, we've done some calculations and I'll present that later on, uh, not today, but when, we, when we're ready for that, where we'll have to uh, add so many cents per gallon to have them pay back their fair share. We generally use 60% of the fuel and we, quote, sell 40% of the fuel. So 40% of the cost ought to be uh, received by us over a period of time. So we have to come up with a methodology that's acceptable to everybody. Okay. And that's that's for the above ground, the, basically the pumps. Yes. Above ground, yes. correct. Mm -hmm. yeah. correct. The pumps in the computer system to keep track of it. Actually, okay. then it'll go directly to, uh, to the municipal building and, and you know the building and so on. There's an automated systems that are great these days. How many outside entities use that, uh, use our fuel farm? Think about five others. We have uh, Beverly Fire Department, uh, the Lanco Fire Department, um, the Sewer Authority, us, uh, the police, school district, uh, school district, 
uh, Beverly Public Works. So we we uh, we use it pretty pretty much. I'm sorry. There's about 15, 17 different uh, organizations. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I think that's how uh, Atlantic Richfield started. Is the you know two yeah. pumps and, and a <laughs> tank in the ground. All right, John. Uh, on with the capital stuff. Uh, yes. More. Now uh, there's some there's some panels. They're they're called door sweeps. Uh, last year, uh, I got to put two in, and uh, it's for it goes around the doors, the outside of the garage doors, to keep the cold air from coming in and having this heater run all the time. Uh, and then also uh, we need to repave out front of the garage. Um, that's to start it, starting to disintegrate. Um, I like to try to get a new mower, um, a 60 inch mower to try to keep up with the, you know, the grass cutting. Um, our biggest item is, uh, we're going to be needing a, a street sweeper. I had reached out to Edgewater park and I, I tried to talk to them, but, uh, I guess the, uh, I, I don't, to be honest with you, I don't know what happened, but I, I had made a proposal to them. I said, if, uh, cause they just got a brand new sweeper and they don't use it because they just don't have enough guys. And, um, uh, I told them, you know, why don't we buy half of it and we'd have it. And, you know, instead of spending 200,000, spend a hundred thousand, um, but I never got no answer on it. Um, I guess one of these days I'll have to call Tom and find out um, whether they are up or not for it. But um, uh, we're definitely going to need a, a new street sweeper. Our back on our street sweeper is starting to rot out, and it's going to be very expensive to replace it. I mean, we can get by for now, um, but... Um, I just want to you know, make sure that everybody's aware that we're we, we would like to try to get one. How old is the current uh, sweeper? That uh, I remember we bought that. Uh, uh, it's a two. It's no, we've we are. That's probably a. I think a two thousand eight. Oh boy, time flies. Yeah, <laughs> I, I know, and you know, uh, luckily with Bobby Crabtree, he keeps track of everything. Um. So he, he, he basically the only one that runs it, which is why it's been lasting so long. I just had last week, I'd had a, a demo to come here for a day. But when I realized that it was trash day, I said, no, nah, can't have it. We can't have trying to go around all these trash cans. So he's going to come back in and, and uh, uh, bring this, you know, this sweeper in and uh, I'm going to, see how it really is before we make any, uh, you know, um, what we're going to do. Right. Um, also, uh, 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 there's a crack sealer um, I put in last year. We have a lot of large cracks, and uh, there's a couple ways we could do it. We could uh, rent it or buy it, but I say rent it. Uh, it's, it's quite expensive, but... Uh, to try to uh, fix some of these streets where they have the large cracks because they're only going to get worse. And um, uh, so that, you know, uh, is in need. The repairing uh, the parking lot out town hall, uh, they're starting out front. Uh, there seems to be a lot of cracks. So we'll have to keep an eye on that. And then uh, my other last item is uh, to rent a uh, like a small excavator so we can um, once in a while clean out some of these ditches that we have just to keep maintaining them for DEP and that, that's it for now those items by the way actually be operating items but they're outside of the norm so he put them on this separate list okay. right they're not capital per se right all right very Anything good else to add John no, that's it. Any questions? Anybody got any questions for John? This is the time to get to him directly, but I know you guys can talk to him anytime you want. Hey, I just have one question, um, and I might have missed it. Someone came in my office, but the um, 
the street sweeper that you're looking at, how old is right. that quote? And and what year is the? No, that 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 would be, um, Edgewater Park paid 180, and then I asked the the guy where uh, the dealer, and he said you're talking, you know, they go up so much every year because uh, the. Uh, this one here has the stainless steel dump body in it, and that's what you need. Because uh, if, if you go with steel and with the water and the dirt, it just it just puts a hole in it, and then next thing you know, you're redoing everything. Okay. So, um, and, and 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 our street sweeper, I think, is a 2008, or it might even be a little bit older than that. Cause maybe I think had, that I rode we, on that. I I think I took yeah. the demo with you. Yeah. Yeah. That's getting into it. Yep. Yeah, I'd just be curious on those specs because we just bought one for our Virginia uh, for one of our terminals at work and it was sixty eight thousand. So the two hundred just jumped out at me. Um but yeah. I don't know what year or well, what capacity you're looking at. Yeah, yeah. That, that you can you can if you have a little one, that's mm -hmm. you know, it won't last very, very long. Uh the street sweeper is the highest maintenance right. uh, item that you can have. <laughs> right, so so isn't renting probably a better? What, yeah, we pro we we, we, you, could, you could probably, um, I think they're, they're when well, the last time I got a price just to have somebody to contract it out, mm -hmm. I think it was like, uh, it, it was like 5,000 a week. And it probably would take you probably well if you have it if if you have somebody that comes in you would have to also uh post all the streets so he was able to get down but once he gets done he's gone and then you don't have anything again right. and um so then you start all over but it was like i think it was five thousand a week might even been more than that and that that was quite a while ago so i i can't really um tell you how much all right thanks john yeah we'll look at that as an option you're absolutely right yeah that's a good idea i even you know thought even if uh, edge were but i mean th their problem is they only have one guy that can run it because it's cdl so yeah. um, we can and, talk to them a little bit more about yep. those methodologies too that are both to our benefit and their benefit, if if that makes sense to do, yeah. in terms of having Correct. a piece of vehicle yep. available. So yeah, so John and I will talk to Tom Pulliam. And John, uh, okay. it's not on your list, but you've always been looking for a pole barn for your vehicles that are outside right now. That's that's been on your yes, list. Yes, I, I don't know. Uh, there's uh, um, there are some neat pole barns that. Uh, that you can get. I, I, I mean, it's just, they're expensive, but even a, some type of a lean to out back here uh, might be another okay. avenue to look at. Uh, yeah, we had, you know, we uh, Harry, people... Harry did a preliminary for us, and that's during capital. We'll bring that back up again. You're exactly right. right. Yeah, I just yep. want the, that's always been on the, his wish list. Yep. But it was, well, the thing is, when you buy new equipment and you leave it outside, it's, you know, yeah. It's uh, difficult, but I did find out one thing this year um, that the sewer authority is going to take their um, vac all out of the out of service. So when they do that, I'll be able to have two extra bays. So, right. All righty. Anything else for John right now? I just have, how many weeks do you think that we do sweep the streets in a year? We probably sweep the streets uh, at least three times. At least so, three times. But, so how many weeks with three times? I mean, how many? Well, see, the thing, how that's, long does it take that's, to get through the town? It, it generally takes Bobby about two weeks to get through the town. So... That's that's the problem. Uh, we he's on and off of it. You know, the, if we have something else we have to do, then he's off of it. And uh, it, it it's very hard to 
put one guy on there when you're already short-handed. If you had, you know, sort of an extra guy or something, that would be no problem. But um, one of the things that we we do do is uh, clean the storm drains out, and uh, the our machine that we have does that. Now, yeah. if we get a new street sweeper, that won't have that attachment. Well, they it'll have an attachment, but it's nothing like the vac all. Uh, you're t- you're talking like a eight inch, I mean a ten inch uh, tube instead of uh, like a four or five inch tube uh, to try to suck the you know the debris out of the storm drain. So. Okay. Thanks, John. All right. Okay. Thank you. I'll move on. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Keep the faith. Talk. Okay. Thanks. Talk to you later. Uh, Chief DeSanto with uh, the police budget. Yes. Thank and, you, Mayor. Is, can everybody hear me? Yep. Yeah, good. The, uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time. I'll leave it open for questions. But the, um, the major increase, as you can see, is actually addressing the future a reference to officers who are going to be retiring. Um, I, I believe it's uh, in the best interest financially for the township to address the retiring officers before they retire, not after. Uh, what happens if you wait till after retire, you're going to see a spike in your overtime budget, as well as a uh, increase in the just overall salary and wages uh, item with the budget. Whereas uh, you address it now, you kind of displace that increase over two years. Rather, if you wait until they retire, then you're going to be doing everything in, in one year. So, what, uh, for example, you wait until these two retired, these officers retired in 2021, and then you begin these actions in 2022. And I only have to deal with the overtime that's going to be caused during the nine months or so that uh, you're finding a replacement, training and replacement, and putting that replacement on the street, um, you know, dealing with the overtime that that officer is no longer not even available, and also dealing with the step increases, because every year it's going to get higher and higher. So now you put it off, and so now you're adding an additional, you know, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 into that uh, budget, where this plan begins that process in 2021 and actually won't come to fruition until 2022, which keep in mind in 2022, uh, there's a potential another retirement. So then you're putting yourself even further behind. And uh, you, you can see if you go to Appendix C, I'll just focus on that. It breaks down where the majority of the increases are coming from. And you can see, you know, I guess nearly about 40% of it's coming from the uh, adding two new officers uh, uh, to replace the retiring officers who will be gone by the end of 2021. And, um, and then the rest are, you know, unavoidable increases. You know, you got your contractual increase, then you have your longevity increases, uh, which are part of the contract and step are built into that as well. Some officers are both step and longevity, some just have uh, step increases. And then the um, other increases are uh, related to a class officer, which I think it's a net gain for uh, the township and the officers to maintain that class two position. As I noted in my uh, most recent document that Richard spot to you, that we had a net $32,000 savings in 2020. And that's only with a class two for 10 months of the uh, 12 month year. And uh, we're really feeling it the first couple uh, weeks, uh, I guess for the first month uh, in January 21, we have an officer on military leave. We have an officer out on light duty and uh, we don't have a class two officer. So the average overtime has been in the last couple of weeks, $4,500 uh, covering shifts and the, and the mandated training that's coming down that I made note of in my presentation document. Uh, much of the equipment is just standard uh, continued operation. There's no real large uh, acquisition of equipment. You might see that in 2022, where the um, state is going to be mandating 
a new uh, instrument to measure blood alcohol content. Uh, the current one is is antiquated, and um, so they're moving on to a machine, and you can expect probably eighteen to twenty thousand dollars for that. But that's not this year, in twenty one. Um, they said, uh, putting anything off, I think you're, you're just going to be paying even more money in 2022, and it's going to be more difficult. Um, the way it's dispersed uh, keeps in mind, and you know, um, to that point, keep in mind that the uh, police department did return over a hundred thousand uh, dollars through an incredible scheduling by the lieutenant managing the overtime budget because he had the flexibility of fast to offer or able to save a large large amount of money in time budget and my budget every year you know prepares for the worst and hopes for the best so uh, you know when i do the overtime i'm anticipating that officers are going to use every bit of their time plus there's going to be an issue somewhere down the road um, I, I'll just leave it at that and try to get some feedback and see if we get that logged on. Anyone have any questions on that portion? Now, uh, Chief, can you on your um, on your overview on the new directives and training? Can you just briefly touch on on those line items? Just to, uh, how much time uh, uh, that takes an officer either. Uh, for in-house training, or if they have to go somewhere to attend a class um, for those items? Uh, sure. Um, the handle with care is, uh, like I said, is additional paperwork. Um, you know, little things add up to big things. So handle with care is the school district is familiar with because we're actually working in conjunction with the school district. The new directive is handed out for officers are required any, uh, there's a list of incidents, any incidents which are deemed, uh, I guess, critical. Um, we're to notify the school district that a, uh, a student of theirs were involved in that. And then uh, if they're in, within our district, and then also if um, another police department comes to contact one of our students outside, we're responsible to make sure the school gets notified that that child was involved in the incident so the school can monitor and take appropriate action if necessary. So that uh, came in, you know, effective at the beginning of uh, this year. And um, it's not a large amount of training involved in that, but like I said, it's additional paperwork and on top of everything else. The uh, juvenile justice reform is gonna be the large one. Uh, they, uh, that's probably had, I would say at least an hour to, uh, processing. They have uh, used the uh, criminal justice reform model and are applying it to the juvenile system. And so they're adding steps to the processing. Uh, no longer is it uh, just a matter of the police officer and potentially a juvenile uh, intake officer who would make that determination whether a juvenile should be uh, detained or are lodged into custody. It has now added a, another step of involving an assistant prosecutor and no longer just quickly typing a, um, a complaint up on a PDF file. It's now an electronic system where you uh, need to prepare that document, forward that document, have that document reviewed, approved, and then once that's approved and returned, and then, um, and if there's a circumstance where you believe it doesn't meet the criteria and you think it should go to a higher level of, uh, well, I should say, you believe it needs to be, a person needs to be detained, a juvenile needs to be detained, then you need to take that extra step and get that approval and wait for that approval. So like I said, uh, normally a juvenile processing for a complaint is anywhere from you know, 45 minutes to an hour tops, but now we're talking two hours because now you're at the mercy of someone else getting back to you and uh, getting to a computer and reviewing your process and then actually taking action from the process, not just thoroughly saying, okay, 
So that, that's, uh, and there's a, there's a large amount of training that's going to be involved with that because the uh, system is, you know, taking something simple, making it a little more complex. Use of force is another large one, extremely large, uh, which is going to be very complicated in terms of training. Uh, there's three phases of training involved with that, as I mentioned. Two of those phases involve in-person training. So the plan right now by the state is to have the, I guess, the overview directive training done online or webinar. But the other two phases, which are involved de-escalation and also dealing with emotional persons, uh, that's going to involve actual hands-on scenario-based training where we would send an officer to, um, to become a trainer. Then they would have to come back to the PD and train every one of our, well, one of our officers. Now, they're only addressing the initial training for 2021 for this uh, directive. I'm sure there's going to be continuous uh, professional training to follow up on this as uh, you know, circumstances change and more information is learned, more techniques are developed. So that's, uh, that's going to be quite an on taking. And that use of force training also involves vehicle pursuits, which is also is going to involve an update training. And then also less, less lethal weapon, which would be in our case, the controlled energy device, also commonly known as the taser. So that's, uh, that's being updated. So that's uh, that's in the annual training anyway, and that could be folded in with the annual training. But just the use of force in the three-phase training is going to be a large on-taking on for all law enforcement officers in 2021. And then you know, the obvious recreational marijuana, there's no directives or information on that yet. But when that comes down, there's going to be a, a very difficult time in terms of trying to figure out uh, how to do road testing for under the influence of marijuana. And so every officer in the state is going to be have to get certified in what they call drug recognition expert. So they can attempt to identify the persons under the influence of marijuana with simple, um, you know, blood testing, urine testing is not going to work because those type of substances stay in your body for more than 24 hours. So the legal argument can be made that just because the presence shows up in the test doesn't mean the person was under the influence at the time of the uh, incident. So there's gonna be almost a uh, requirement, well, there's gonna be a requirement, but you almost become a, uh, uh, an expert in the field of recognizing and identifying a person's under the influence of um, you know, controlled substances. Um, Thank you. I just wanted to highlight uh, those points because uh, it, it does take away from the officer on the street or in the vehicle. And uh, I, I just wanted to, since you put that in your overview, uh, give you the opportunity to, to expand on that. Uh, questions from the committee for Mr. I, I have a question regarding the um, juvenile. <laughs> um, I know several years ago, um, there was a complaint regarding a couple of juveniles at Gateway Park. Uh, one of the residents was filing a complaint and they were pretty obnoxious to me. And it seemed like the county, uh, if I'm not mistaken, prosecutor's office did not contact the local police department uh, to let our officers know about the hearing. Um, I think it was like a the, the kids got like a slap on the hand. And I wonder if that process has changed any because the residents were upset with me thinking we um, just, you know, dismissed the complaint and we didn't, we didn't have any idea. When I called the prosecutor's office, they told me that they had, uh, they did not have to notify the local police department when the case was being heard. Um, that was their jurisdiction once it became a juvenile complaint, and we were never notified. That is, that is correct. Is that, that hasn't changed. Is that still the same process? The same, yes. And oh. this actual new directive actually makes it more difficult to actually sign the complaint in terms of, well, I shouldn't say more, it becomes more restrictive 
on terms on times you can sign a complaint. Um, and also gives the ability for the prosecutor's office to continue to override your wanting to sign a complaint and force it to become a station house adjustment. Um, yeah. And that's that's the reality. Very frustrating. They, they say they want to work in cooperation and for us to pass on any known previous activities that would advise them of but first time offenders that are caught. Uh, you know, it comes down to they're really pushing to become, um, a, you know, station house adjustments, basically, where you handle it in house. Um, and there is no actual complaint. Sometimes you have more control that, that way, too, um, in terms of getting apologies and so forth. But some juveniles, as we know, uh, that doesn't work, you know. Um, so everyone's different. But now that that is still the uh, correct uh, procedure. Uh, once it, the complaint actually gets to their level, they're the ones to determine whether they're going to prosecute it or dismiss it upon certain items being completed. Thank you. Any other questions of Chris, John, Vern? Right. No, I'm all right. Cool. Thank you, Chief. All right. Well, like I said, I, I just stress that uh, I, mean, I don't have the numbers to show you what to demonstrate specifically what it would look like if you pushed it off. But uh, like I said, strongly, rec strongly recommend. And because um, the process does someone until um, you get them back on the road and now you've uh, you build a, 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 a out system as far as uh, staffing and, and, yeah. all right and so well, appreciate thank that. you lieutenant do you have anything you want to add before I, that i missed no i have nothing further you, you uh pretty much clarified everything okay all right. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Committee. Okay. And, and Chief, one last thing. You, you're looking at two retirements this year and one in, in possibly 22. in 22? Yes. Okay. And, you know, we have the officer who signed up, he signed for military, uh, he's in the military reserves, and and he's yet to complete a full year without being uh, deployed. All right. Thank you. And Thanks, Chief. One, more yes, yeah. one more question. Um, this budget that you submitted does include a new vehicle this year? Yes, it does. Okay. Which we're probably, you know, we're not going to get last year's new vehicle until May of this year. So, and, uh, and, and it will, you know, probably impact the maintenance line item, which I didn't anticipate uh, because the longer you hang on to one of the older cars, the more maintenance there is going to be. So hopefully it'll work out where um, you know, the maintenance part of the budget isn't impacted so much. But yes, it does. Uh, my theory is to replace one car every year and then you rotate them, through, you know, you rotate your fleet at a reasonable level and, and uh, you're not uh, keeping vehicles that are going to nickel and dime you to death where you're, you know, by the time you get done to maintenance, cost for one vehicle, you could have bought a new vehicle. So that, like I said, my plan is to replace a patrol car every year. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, next up, uh, Mrs. Lohr, administration. Mm -hmm. Hello, everyone. Um, the municipal clerk's budget is pretty straightforward. Um, many of the sub accounts in the operating budget are um, driven by statutory requirements. Um, the activity level of ordinances that the committee adopts. If uh, so, uh, the amount for that is is pretty constant, except in those years where uh, we've had them, where there's 30 between 30 and 40 ordinances. That's particularly in a year where there's um, a lot of uh, land use ordinances being done as a result of a master plan uh, update and reexamination. But we don't have that, so I anticipate about the same level for 2021. Same way with codification. That's a tough number. Uh, depending on that depends on the level of resolution and, and ordinance activity that would drive that codification uh, requirement that the state requires that we do every year. And um, <clears throat> some years it's actually over the sub account amount and other years uh, um, like codification for 2020 uh, is actually below. So it, it, it varies. Again, um, 
the um, elections number is uh, is usually around that uh, three thousand mark for election costs that uh, the county bills us. I'm not quite sure what 2020 is going to be. It was a very different year with the mail-in ballots, and and uh, so I don't know. Uh, they, they say that we're not getting charged for the printing of the ballots and and the return postage on those uh, vote by mail ballots, but we'll see. We're either going to maybe save a little bit of money in that line item, or um, it'll be a lot more expensive depending on how that billing comes in, which I have not received yet. Uh, I guess the main um, uh, item that has a little bit of a bump in it um, is in the uh, training courses. Uh, that line item supports um, ongoing CEUs, continuing education units that the licensed officials um, that are required by statute, uh, people that have licenses, uh, continue uh, their education and, and receive, have to recertify every year or three years. Uh, so that line item supports that. Um, also, uh, we're gonna continue with um, starting to send people to school for uh, some training. We've done a lot of, uh, we have some new people on board, uh, newer people. We're gonna continue, um, continue with our internal and cross training uh, as always uh, ongoing in the office. And, but we're also going to send some people out to school as we continue uh, our education efforts and also um, continuing to develop our bench strength in, in, in the office. Um, that's about it. If anybody has any questions, the same way, the same is pretty much so for the registrar's budget. It's a, a lot less, but it does support the uh, those statutory requirements that we have to use certain forms and uh, safety paper, and it, they're not cheap <laughs> so, um, that are required for the vital statistic uh, cert certifi uh, certificates and um, licenses uh, and the CEUs for the registrars uh, for their continuing education. Um, does anybody have any questions at this time? Do you want, Janice, you're going to talk about the uh, COH and the, the rental inspection programs? Yes, I actually uh, was, if, uh, was going to take an opportunity to uh, get some, actually some formal action um, by motion of the governing body on a couple items. And one um, for uh, 2021 would be the continuation of uh, the uh, rental and COH um by self-certification when the unit is occupied. The governing body um, did approve that for 2020. This is a response to COVID. Um, we're holding up sending out notices. Um, so I didn't wanna wait till the February 1st meeting. I thought we could get that in real quick. And uh, our inspectors, particularly the for the rental, uh, still is not um, inspecting if a unit is occupied. So I would ask that the township committee um, authorize a, a continuation of the self-inspection um, for the rental program for 2021 because of the co because of COVID. Yeah, it also has an impact on how much we budget. We pay the inspector by the inspection for the uh, rental, so that if you look, you'll see that we mm -hmm. paid a lot less in 2020 than we budgeted, and we could then instead of I put in what we had done in 2019 assuming we're back to in person, but if we're gonna continue with the self-inspection, then we can budget based on the 2020 numbers, which is several thousand dollars. But uh, you know that's why Janice needs to know whether you have any problems with uh, doing it that way, and then we can plan and budget based on that. Is any under How did that work out, Janice? Did, um, were the landlords uh, supportive of that and sending the information back? For the most part, yes. Uh, Jessica, who's the lead on that program, did have to chase uh, uh, several of the, um, you know, the uh, rental property owners, but it turned out to be, uh, be done very well. So uh, with the COVID numbers still very high and um, our inspector, has indicated that he will not go into an occupied unit. I'd like to continue the, the um, uh, self-certification process. Um, and uh, now he does uh, he does go in and he is paid for when a property is vacant. Okay. And so, uh, but we'd, and we'd like to continue the self-certification process. And that would be a little bit of a savings for, in the budget um, before 2021 also. Yeah, this questions. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, you say unoccupied. So if a rental pro property, uh, let's say at the end of this month, uh, 
their lease is up and they're out, right. but they have somebody coming in on February 1st. Is that? If we can get the inspection, if they let us know and we can get the inspector out before the new tenants are in, we will do an on-site inspection. But what we find, what we have found there is that they usually don't let us know in time um, before the new people move in. So it becomes occupied. So they have, so the, the owner does a self-certification. Okay. And there are some that are, you know, we, we do get to go in, but for the most part, it's, it's self-certification. And, uh, and this is probably a question to uh, ask Mr. Heinhold, our attorney, but from a liability standpoint, are we still okay? Because the owner who's certifying this on their own, they're taking on that responsibility? Yes. And those forms and the, all the language in those, in, in those forms were all approved by our solicitor. All right. Thank you. Yeah, just so you know, the number's around $10,000. Um, one Cost question. In that, um, in that self-certification, is there any requirement that they notify their tenants, you know, this is the process and here's your rights. If you have a complaint or you think there is a safety concern, here's how, what you do. The tenant always has rights, and that's actually a different process than through the municipality. If there's something that's very egregious, and we've had this over the years, um, we do contact our inspector, and COVID's making this a little bit more difficult, but we will, um, the, the, that inspector will reach out to the property owner to say that there is a complaint of whatever the situation is. Now, normally uh, with non-COVID, we would send the inspector out. Even if that unit's been inspected already for the year, if there is a complaint from the um, tenant, um, we would send the inspector out, but we're doing a lot over the phone. We're actually, um, you know, handling a lot of things, a lot of complaints over the phone and, and getting good results, getting, getting very good results. Um, so the other, uh, now, there used to be a process through the county that the county offered through landlord tenant disagreements, uh, kind of a mitigate, not a mitigation, but a, a complaint process. But they have done away with that. So now, the, the lo locally, we're being relied on more to act as that go between, between the uh, property owner and, and the tenant. Um, but we've had some success. We've had, even with the COVID, we've had a lot of success with um, uh, getting responses from the property owners to, um, and, and I'll, I'm gonna be honest with you, the way we get the responses is that, you know, if we file, if you have to come to court, because a lot of our, pro our, our, land, our property owners, um, rental property owners do not live in county. Some of them don't live in state, many of them don't live in state. And uh, you'd be surprised. I think we have property owners in every state of the United States that own property in Delanco. But we say, what's, you decide. Either you have to come to New Jersey and go to court and pay all those expenses, and, and I will use this, and it's true, um, and see the judge and have that expense, or just take care of the problem. Have your agent, you know, in, in county, your property management company, take care of the problem, and we usually get very good responses, um, you know, remedy with that. Because so. they do, they would have to come to court and come to New Jersey, come to court. Pay all those expenses, court fees, travel fees, everything. Last year, last year was the first year that we did this, and I, I pushed for this, and it, it actually works out very well with uh, cell phone usage and uh, FaceTime. I had each one of my tenants go through room to room and show me uh, any issues, and uh, I mean, basically, the township puts it on me to certify. I put it on my tenant before I'm going to sign it and send it back. They have to prove to me that their smoke detectors are working via the phone, FaceTime, um, and I have text responses as proof. Uh, so it's really it's really not too bad. And if they have any complaints like, hey, uh, this railing is broken or this or that, you know, then that's a different issue. But um, I thought it worked out well and I don't think we're out of the woods with the COVID number. So do you need a motion for us to approve this Janice tonight? Yes. And I was going to say, if you're more comfortable with waiting till February 1st, I can have Jessica hold off on sending out the, um, the notices for 2021 another week. And that way, if you, if you would just want to get uh, Doug's input on that, you know, uh, you know, that, that would be acceptable too. He, he gave the okay it. last time. So I don't. Yeah, do he did. Yeah. yeah. This was not approved without Doug thorough I review. And I had, to, I had answered from an affidavit to a certification. So they didn't have to have it notarized. Right. I would have the motion, John. Tonight, so we can get 
Okay. Uh, the, uh, the, the inspection process takes a while. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Letters. Do you want to make the I'll motion? Second it. Motion, Brown. Second, Kate. Okay. You want all in favor or roll call? Uh, let's do a roll call. Mr. Brown? Yes. Ms. Fitzpatrick? Yes. Ms. Holland? Yes. Mr. Olette? Yes. Mr. Templeton? Yes, thank you. And the other issue I had really isn't my budget. It's really more the, um, is uh, we are very, very low on uh, people renewing their dog and cat licenses. Uh, um, New Jersey statute requires that dog licenses um, be done by uh, January 31st. And we are off almost by 50% at this time. So what I would uh, ask the town, and I know there's been a lot with people with COVID and now with the vaccinations rolling out, people have been trying to navigate through the vaccination sign up process and how to get registered and what phase you're determined to be in. Um, and a lot of things are going on. Um, I would like to um, ask the township committee to um, extend the late fee or uh, actually hold off on the late fee by one month that there, we continue into February with no late fee. And we can put that out on the website and blast it and everything to say, you know, there's another one month additional grace period, if that's okay. Um, I, I, you know, it's been a tough, it's, it's been a tough winter. It's been a tough year. And I think people just aren't thinking about, oh, dog licenses. So. Um, and from, I, a budget, like from a budget standpoint, if you don't get the income from the dog license, you have to subsidize the animal control fund because the cost doesn't change out of the appropriation. So we currently appropriate 5,000. You probably have to add two, three, four thousand dollars $4,000 to that. So Janus office can use that to get more people to sign up and pay their license. That's the budget side. The public health side is that we need people to license their dogs. Uh, that would make sense to try because you're gonna have to do something, either put more money in the budget or chase them down, take them to court. And I think also, um, that's a good point. Another uh, reason I think a lot of people have not, those with um, those with dogs and cats with expired rabies um, vaccinations, um, they cannot get a license, a new license without an up-to-date rabies vaccination. And most towns have canceled their January rabies clinics. So um, I, we do ours in November, but uh, anyone that was looking for a rabies clinic is going to be very hard pressed to find one. Most have canceled them. So we want to give people the opportunity to get that vet, that the vet appointment and, and get their dog or cat in, get it vaccinated, get the certificate so they can now get the license. So um, if it's okay with Township Committee, I would like to recommend that we extend the dog and cat license uh, licensing uh, process through February without a late fee. I'll make that motion said. Well, I want to comment. I, I noticed uh, the last time that I went door to door campaigning and, you know, meeting people, there's a lot of new people in town that do dogs. I, you know, they, you know, the dogs always want to greet. You. Nobody has a collar on with a tag. And uh, I'm police know when they're picking dogs up. A lot of people aren't doing it. And I don't think there's any. Uh, uh, I don't think younger people really understand the severity, but there should be more uh, fines written if they don't. We used to do the dog census, right? And go out and send somebody out there. Yeah, the, work. the state of New Jersey um, did away with requiring the uh, census of dogs. Okay. The dog census. Well, so we are not required. We and that was, as a result, taken out of the budget. If you're yeah, John, something you're out breaking the up a bit. John, um, you're breaking up. I'm sorry. Let's, let's, I'm breaking up. Let's I make prepare. a motion. I just think you need to warn people. Oh, yeah. You need to. He's unstable. Let's My let's hair. defer this to the to next Monday night uh, and address. Okay. This. I'd like to keep the budget thing keep it keep us moving on this. Um, anything else, uh, Mr. Laura, for your department and. Uh, Okay, so you don't want to vote on the late fee thing right now? We'll do it next. We'll talk about it next Monday. Monday, okay. All right. All right. Anything That's else? All I have, unless anyone has additional questions. All right. Yeah, you, you're the minute.
administration kind of is the confluence of a lot of different things. Uh, you got a lot of your staff wear multiple hats and, and their, uh, the, the budget really kind of scatters out uh, in different departments, planning board, finance, and, and, and so forth. So, um, And as far as capital, um, we need a couple new monitors. There's some people working with old monitors where you're tweaking the wires, but the icons still stretch across the... Um, <laughs> the screen so that and Dan our IT person has saying I just can't I just can't tweak these anymore that they're, they're the wires are right. shot so we do need a couple new monitors you got that on your capital request right well no the monitors are operating capital is the uh, is a new server, server. All right. yeah seven thousand plus for new server and then another three thousand operating to install it okay uh Mr. Schwab can okay. I ask Janice a question because I um I noticed that um, we're moving, do we have a part-time employee that we're moving to full-time? That was done in 2020. Okay, because I noticed it still says add a full-time employee for full year. Oh, that I, that I just didn't. Well, because it was budgeted only for half a year because the yeah, change right. didn't take place after Oh, 20. okay, right. for 2020. So, so, it's so last year we budgeted year. for half year and full-time for half year. This time we got full time the whole year, which is why the increase is Please. half of okay. a, an annual salary. Right. Thank you. Good pickup. All right. Uh, thank you all very much for uh, listening through that stuff, and I hope you enjoyed reading all the material. Uh, the key item for me to go over is the grand totals. Uh, if you take the the first sheet. The, the main sheet, which is the spreadsheet that's got each item and salary and wage, other expenses. The absolute last line is total without grants. Because the problem with grants is that it shows up on the income side and it shows up on the expenditure side. They're offsetting. And if you look at the grand total budget, it could make the budget go higher or lower and doesn't affect the ability to raise funds through uh, independent action, whether it's taxes or other revenues. But the total without grants between 2020 and what's been proposed without any review, without any uh, changes, is exactly as it came in, uh, is about 3.17%, $200,000. So without doing anything, we even talked about saving $10,000 here without even blinking about the uh, inspection. So that doesn't mean that it's going to be $200,000. It's going to be certainly less than that. But we're, we're starting out, even with some of these other things, uh, in a good overall uh, place. But so what you want to do is you look, look at the next sheet, which is the uh, significant increase and decreases. Significant being anything that's over 5% or over $5,000. You can have increases that are huge, but are only a few hundred dollars on small accounts. Because again, the net is 197,900, 200,000. Uh, some of the things you'll see are what uh, Kate just mentioned, the $17,000 increase in administration salary and wage for that part-time person for a full year, $3,000 for the new server installation. I added things for the legal and engineering based on prior years. The legal depends on, this year we had very high because of the litigation through the land use board. Uh, if we don't get any appeals or don't have any of those issues, of course, it'll be a lot less. And again, the goal of, a, of, of the amount you appropriate is to make sure you don't go over it. Remember the chief even mentioned with the police budget, you budget for the worst and hope for the best. We always spend significantly less than we budget. Uh, nobody spends more money than they have to. But if you don't budget it and you end up needing it, we make transfers after November 1st and luckily we haven't needed much. But otherwise you get into emergencies and they affect the next year and the next year and the next year. Instead, what we've done is we've had appropriation surpluses that then we carry on to two years later. It goes into reserve and then it goes into the next year's budget. And those things help stabilize your tax rate. That's the key. But the bottom line is, in my view, you look at, I'll make sure we're not going to exceed that number and we trust that we're not going to spend more than we need to. So the legal and engineering are based on that. The engineering is a little higher because we have more, we're doing more road work and we got more state aid, and we have to pay for the uh, design of the roads through the operating budget, whereas the design for the roads with our own money 
is out of the capital budget, but what state aid money has to come out of here. Um, we had an increase for the first time in casualty insurance. We went over the, the issue, we're, we're on this special uh, program with the joint insurance fund, uh, where if it exceeds a certain number, we're gonna have to pay even more five years from now or three years from now. But we still have an increase based on the actuarial calculations of our liability and workers comp, both items. Uh, have, have increased. Uh, and it's not, we, have, we have, don't have frequency, we have some severity issues where if somebody gets hurt, it's a more serious thing, a shoulder injury, shoulder surgery is a long-term thing as opposed to uh, someone who tweaks uh, an ankle. Employee group insurance, interesting, this is the first time in three years there's been an increase in the state health benefit rates, plus we've added extra police officer and extra full-time employees in in the non-police area. So we have more employees that we're covering and at a higher rate. Fortunately, it's still, even though it's 33,000, it's 7% more. Police salary and wage, the chief talked about the 100,000 plus, which is six and a half percent. The OE is about 9 point, about 10%. And that has to do with the cost to send officers to an academy. And it has to do with maintaining the equipment that we have. We have maintenance agreements on all these things, most of which is required by law or required for liability, such as the various, the cameras, whether it's body cameras or the dashboard cameras, uh, any of the equipment that we have has a lot of software involved and we have to pay for the maintenance of that. So if you look in that detail, you'll see that most of it is those three areas. Solid waste collection and disposal, big increases because we have more households, more people adding the crossings, adding Cornerstone, brought in some uh, brought in some costs. Now you're gonna see when we have the assessed valuation and the pilot payments and so on, that'll be on the revenue side that may well offset this significantly. But from the appropriations standpoint, we have a significant increase in solid waste collection. There's a new contract, the first year of a three-year contract, this vendor, tends to bump it in that first year and then the next couple of years are fairly minor. Uh, last time it was zero for the next three years. We had a pretty big increase. Plus we have, uh, and when, when crossings is all done, there's gonna be a hundred new units there. Plus we have to reimburse Cornerstone for mm -hmm. certain of their collection costs. So all that's built in. The disposal costs, obviously we have more trash being taken to the landfill. We have to pay hundred percent of what Cornerstone does and what the crossings does. So we have to anticipate that. Those are in there. Uh, the public buildings, you'll see one offsetting the other. Uh, we've reduced uh, the time that our uh, employee works, but COVID has pointed out that we need a significant improvement in the cleanliness function of the municipal building and, and public works. We started with a vendor to do that for COVID purposes and to maintain that and paying a contractor to do it compared to paying the equivalent of a minimum wage employee uh, is, has added something, has added about $10,000 to the budget. Uh, vehicle maintenance is up uh, a little bit, but vehicle fuel is down, which is interesting. Our telephone costs are up, but we're I'm gonna be making a re recommendation to change vendors, but we do have to invest in new equipment. The current vendor is charging, has increased their billing. We're outside of our contract, and they've said, you know, if you want to keep doing it, it'll cost that much more. So we've been paying more. The alternative is a much smaller annual cost if you invest in new equipment. Uh, we had water went up. The inspection rentals and certificate of habitability we talked about, it did go up a little bit. Now it'll go down. Two other big items, pension, both police and fire, both police pension and the public employee pension, up 15 and 20%. Again, just like the medical, we have new employees. They now are on the books. The actuary figures out what the pension costs will be for when they're ready to retire. And so every time you do that, you not only pay the salaries, but you pay the build up costs. We talk about that every time. Capital Improvement Fund, I plugged in a number of $25,000 more than last year. The capital Improvement stuff you'll get in the next two or three weeks, and we'll discuss it at the February meeting. That's a decision that you make. Things that John talked about, things that Janice talked about, uh, we talked about whether we do the pole barn or we don't do the pole barn. Uh, we're going to talk later on uh, at, at the meeting, not today, about 200 ash, whether we need to put more money into that, et cetera. 
So you have those projects and you're all well aware of them. We did though build in the 200,000 for the road program uh, already. So this is for down payment money for new borrowing. And uh, our reserve uncollected taxes will always rise. This is the worst case scenario. But if you know, remember we collect it all, the school district, the county, the fire district, uh, all get 100% of what they uh, put in their budgets. Any unpaid is absorbed by the municipality. We do all the collection costs and we handle the unpaid. That's the efficient system uh, for everybody else, but it does impact our budget significantly. There is an assumption, even though we had a pretty good collection rate this year, not much different than prior years, that maybe 2021 won't be so good. And you may wanna be a lot more conservative in terms of how much you're gonna put in that number, which means having a larger number, because if you do collect, if you assume a 3% on collection rate and you end up with a 5% on collection rate, we're in the whole 100,000 bucks. So you have to you know, make some judgments uh, and we our budget relatively small and that makes a big difference. Some of the things that went down, the amounts that we put in for the salary and wage, you know, we for code enforcement, zoning and so on, we, our contract with Mount Holly is working out well. It ends up being less than we anticipated last year. Uh, the planning services we didn't end up using a lot. So I'm assuming we're gonna continue at that level. Public works uh, we is a reduction actually because last year we budgeted for all six people that John talked about. And this year I'm budgeting as if we're gonna replace that person but not until March or April, depending on what you uh, authorize perhaps in February and you start getting somebody on. So we can save some money in that area. Um, public buildings and grounds, we talked about the vehicle fuel, lower usage and lower rates. It's interesting, lower usage is significant, but the rates are much lower. Uh, electric is also a little lower. Uh, you'll see REC has proposed a reduction in their request because for the uh, funding from the township budget, because they had a surplus. We gave them X amount last year. They ended up having to cancel most of their programs. So that surplus carries forward and we get the benefit of that in this budget. But very significantly is our debt. If you remember two years ago, we made the final bond payment on the building and we then used the savings to pay off all these accumulated several million dollars of bond anticipation notes. Uh, we now are to the point where we don't have to pay off as much. There's a requirement when you have notes paying off a certain percentage in particular years. And so I sent you a spreadsheet. We'll go over in some detail with the auditor at the February meeting, the end of February meeting. You have a choice as to how much you want to spend. So I did a recommendation and this recommendation is $140,000 less in payments of debt service than we did last year. Uh, but that is something that you can make those decisions on based on the end result you're looking for. So that's uh, the quick and dirty. And I'm wondering if anyone, as you went through the details, calculations and any of this stuff, whether you have any questions that I can answer at this point in time. And then I got a couple other minor things after that. Um, I have a question. Yeah. Since since we're working on the appropriations, um, is I did listen to the uh, school board meeting um, that they had last uh, last week, and um, is there? Uh, I know last year we were not in a position to make the contribution to the school because we had already uh, accepted our budget and it was adopted. Um, but is there a way for the township to make a contribution to the school in this budget since it hasn't been adopted? I know we've done that in the past. And I wonder if that calculation couldn't come from the pilot money once we get the figure on the pilots that we're currently receiving um, that I know most, some of them are coming close to the end of the pilot, but I wonder if there's a way that we can make a contribution to the school to help them in their financial um, downfall right now. Yeah, I and mean, that's a question to ask the auditor and, and the solicitor. Financially, that's what you'll be able to see. If you pick a number, 
and plug it in when we get the uh, surplus and the revenue numbers, you'll be able to see what the impact is in the tax rate. So uh, you can make that, that's, that's a, this is the time to do it though, Kate, you're exactly right. Uh, to have done it, you know, after we were already introduced a budget is a different story. Uh, a number of years ago, we did it for specific programs, whether right. or not you can do a, a flat amount, you can take the portion, a portion of the pilot, as you suggest, 5% uh, has to go to the county. There's no requirement that anything go to the school district, but that doesn't mean that the governing body of the municipality can't make an allocation decision, as I understand it. But again, these are those are legal questions. I've never personally been involved with uh, doing such a thing, but uh, now's the time to talk about it. And you should think about, and I'm sure the presentation here later and, and the interest from the uh, school district representatives uh, would indicate that uh, that's something you ought to consider. If you end okay. up, we end up making judgments. For example, I mentioned the debt service. You could spend $20,000 less in debt service and that money could be allocated elsewhere if let's say it hits the tax rate you're interested in. On the other hand, that means that's you have to pay that off again in the future or you're gonna do less capital work. So you have to decide the needs of your organization and whether or not you can afford to do that whether it's a one-time thing, sometimes one-time revenues hurt the recipient because then the next year they don't have them. But, you know, I see they have a significant issue. So it's an excellent uh, time to talk about it. So I know that some of the pilots, um, I don't think we pay the 5% to the county because I believe that law or request came in after some of our pilots were already in effect? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Okay. They, they asked us for all the information. We gave them the information. Okay. We have not gotten a bill yet. Okay. Now, the argument oh. can be made that, that they can't go, they certainly can't go back and ask for 5% of what's been paid to date. Right, right. So even if, let's say a pilot that we got 20 years ago and it's a 25-year pilot and there's, or 15 years ago, it's a 20-year for the next five years, they probably get that 5%. The fact they didn't ask was the county policy, but I'm not sure whether or not they asked, got the information and still are backing off. Uh, other people on this board may have better idea what the county's plans are, uh, but we yeah. have not ever gotten a bill from them. Okay, thank you. It's something to consider. I'm definitely gonna push for it. Very good, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, this is uh, yeah, with dealing with the pilot money, uh, we had the one pilot program where uh, there were some miscalculations and we may gain something from that. So we could look at that money, uh, I guess, as being found money to help the school board. Interesting point. Very good. Yeah, Doug will talk about that at the exec session. February 1st, he's been in touch with uh, uh, the audit, the assessor and the tax collector to try to finalize what that number is. Okay. That is good. a one-time, it's a one-time thing. You're right. Right. Thank you. Anything else to add there, Mr. Schwab? Yeah, the other thing I want to add, which may be part of found money, but I, I sent you an email on the uh, uh, the sewer fair share. Yeah. We'll talk about it in detail and exact on February 1st. But I want to make sure that everyone had the information when that kind of money comes in, it comes in as what's called unanticipated revenue. Unanticipated revenue then ends up being part of the available surplus in the following year. So any, so the money, for example, we got from Stylex for their fair share contribution ended up, that is available as part of the available surplus that we use for the 2021 budget. Anything that we get in the Dolan case, the Dolan uh, connection, whatever that ends up being uh, would not, have any positive any impact on us till 2022 but if you're thinking about replacing things and you're going to be thinking about how much to uh set as your bottom line with uh, dolan if you need money in our budget to whether to help with school district budget or to cover projects that when we talk about capital and other things we don't have and we're thinking about 2022 and beyond that's an important thing primarily and secondarily it will set a precedent for the three or four other connections that we might have. So uh, is anyone from a process standpoint, does any new in, anyone need any new information on the Dolan sewer connection thing, or we can wait till February 1st and discuss it with Doug? 
I just wondered, did we already set a precedent when we did uh, Powerhouse and Stylix? For well, our, let's, not our get fair too share. Deep, let's not get too deep into this because this is uh, some confidential it, information. Yeah, okay. I, I think, though, Kate, the key thing is that it's where we're starting from. We have so many different numbers on what the number was originally for those properties. Right. And that even if we use the same principles that we used for the other connections, the numbers are all over the place. They are. But okay. uh, it's, it's an interesting point. But I just want to bring that up because as Fern brought up, you know, if you've got, quote, found money, uh, you can take keep that in the back of your mind when you're making these other decisions. Um, Thank you. Okay. And then the other thing to note is it's a small item. Uh, the state sent a notice in the middle of COVID that I don't think anybody paid attention to, that we all have to update our ordinances for stormwater. Yes. They, just like we did with uh, flood control, if you remember, it's like 40 pages that we plug into our code book. And we actually used the new state regulations. Kitty was great to do that with, with uh, the Dolan uh, application, but this is for new large uh, development applications. And uh, in order to be in compliance, we have to adopt this new ordinance and it requires looking at the existing and looking at the proposed and seeing what's changed. One idea is you just adopt the new one and replace the old one and assume that it's gonna be okay. I've been in touch with uh, uh, Harry, our engineer about their firm helping do that. Originally, they're doing that for several municipalities including Edgewater Park. So there's a lot of base information they have. So I'm gonna be working with them to come up with something could cost us several thousand dollars, or I could try to do it on my own and see if we can't get this thing uh, behind us. But that's one more thing that you're gonna see on your plate, some big fat technical ordinance that none of us understand, but the state requires us to adopt. So I just wanna let you know that. That's really all I have, uh, unless anybody has any more detailed questions. All right, uh, let's see from uh, Ms. LaSalle, are you gonna give us a brief or? Is there another person that's going to be doing that? Uh, um, uh, um, I can or... just do. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I can just give a, a brief overview. I want to thank you for the opportunity um, to let, let us speak with you today. Um, and the reason that we're here is to bring to your attention the school district's budget. Um, I think that most of you probably had a chance to look at the presentation that I sent to you last night. Um, it was the presentation that I gave to the Board of Ed last week, and it was to go over the 1920 audited expenditures, um, which you know impact excess surplus and future budgets. So the main point of that presentation was that 36% um, of our expenditures were tuition and transportation costs, and these have greatly increased over the past three years. Um, we've we've seen a significant increase in out of district or special education uh, placements. Um, in 1920, we spent over $3 million on tuition and, and transportation costs. Um, well, tuition costs, transportation was over $400,000. So together, these costs were over $504,000 increase over the prior year. Um, there was also a $100,000 increase in the related services, PT, OT, speech, one-to-one -one nurses, aides, et cetera. Um, so our 21-22 budget is starting off um, in, in the whole $787,000. And how, as Mr. Schwab said, you budget for the worst and hope for the best. We are having difficulty budgeting for the worst because it just keeps getting worse and worse. Um, and we're here just to ask for any help that that might be available. So your your current uh, excess surplus right now going into this year is the three three hundred eighty two k, correct? That's yes, and it was over one point one million the year before, so we can see that huge difference. So, so you've spent the seven eighty seven, correct? Yeah, they um, there was unbudgeted out of district placements last year over $600,000 that we just, you just can't, 
you can't see it coming and there's nothing that you can do to avoid it. Does, go ahead. When does the, um, when does the school start to um, be able to use the taxes from the new properties at the crossings? When does that come into your budget? Because there are, um, I mean, you know, the, the best case scenario was that Havnanian was going to build his project at the same time Cornerstone was built. That's what we had anticipated, and that didn't happen. So those additional rentals that came in did hurt the school budget with uh, placements. But now that the crossings is being built and that they're becoming rateables, um, when does that, when, when do those funds start to help the school in receiving that? Yeah. They're gonna see some of it in this year's budget, but mostly in next year's. Okay. Because only a small portion has been done. Added assessments, anything that got a CO during 2020 uh, is billed as an added assessment municipality bills that it's one of right. those as we, we talked about the the vagaries of uh, property tax collection in the state and how things work out so added assessments all go to the municipality uh, whereas omitted get shared and then so it's it's the new stuff that starts coming in uh, in 2021 I made a note to ask Joe Raymond to give that information but I'm sure they'll get there when we get the uh, assess value number to use for budget, they'll get it at the same time I get it. And we'll see whether there's been any significant increase in that. Uh, there should okay. be some, should be there some, should be but, some but, but next year, not, not enough to uh, offset with their yeah, No, but next year it would be more substantial, I would think. Yes, absolutely. So that's, that's a good point. We talked about the one time and how you don't want to rely on one time, but the one time might be enough, might be the equivalent of bridge loan, let's say. Right. Without well, using the word loan, but I'm talking about a mortgage methodologies but the so added assessments point. it doesn't matter because it depends on what the school district budget was if if you've got the added assessments coming into you know the total tax base that's just that just allows everyone else's tax rate to go down but it really doesn't change you know what the what the school district needs and what they ask for in a budget uh has got nothing to do with the added assessments well the added assessments are different than when they, they're on the actual tax rolls. I think right. added, added assessments are just anything that is partial year. It was not right. in the yeah. original total valuation of the community. Exactly. So when Next the total year, valuation of the community goes up and you divide it by the amount to be collected by taxation, it does affect the tax rate. It does. So Definitely. therefore, if the school district needs to increase their total amount to be collected right. by taxation, and it's divided by a bigger number of the tax rate impact is not as right. great. I think that's what we all look for. We look for, we, you know, you have to spend more money, but you don't have to ask each individual to pay as big a jump. Well, part of the problem here is, is that when you've got uh, uh, students that uh, whose needs cannot be satisfied or accommodated within the district have to be sent out of district and those services transportation, whatever extraordinary services need to be taken care of. If that's a new student coming in, uh, well, let's start with the first case. If it's an existing resident of Delanco, when, um, as far as state aid, federal aid support for that, uh, and, and I don't believe it covers 100% what that expense will be. Not even when does that come, what does yeah. that, when does that show up in your uh, budget or when do you receive that? And so, then the second case would be a family, a student coming in that is classified that needs services and you cannot accommodate it. When, uh, when can you expect any kind of reimbursement from the feds or the state on that? Those counts are done in August, um, in October, but they're not applied until the following year. So, and, and we get a small percentage of those fees. It's not 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 nearly anything to, to cover it. Mm -hmm. So uh, just to jump in here, if we have a student enroll uh, 
after the October, for October 15th date when it comes to generating that report, uh, we will not see any funding related to that student uh, for a, a full year plus additional time because that student would not appear on the report until next October 15th report, and then it's another year. So it's, um, it takes a tremendous amount of time just to get that funding for a student that uh, would receive extraordinary aid when it comes to special ed, for example, that, that type of thing. And, and as far as a percentage of what that cost would be, and I know it's, it's completely variable on what the needs of, of a student would be, but it's 10%, 50%, Right now, if we look at our total budget, uh, we are spending about 10% on out of district tuition alone. Now that's for pre-K through eight. So that's what we can really work on, uh, nine through 12 and above. And I say above because school districts are responsible for students up until age 21. So um, pre-K through eight tuition alone is $1.1 million. Uh, and that is 25 students. So those 25 students, uh, the, the cost to educate them varies, but some of them, the tuition is approaching $100,000 just for the tuition. Then all the services, uh, aides, nurses, as well as uh, transportation, an aid on the bus, uh, assistive technology, you name it. So one student in particular, for example, hypothetical student could cost uh, somewhere around, let's say $150,000 to educate, which is far more than uh, is required to educate a student that does not require that program. So uh, yeah, so it's uh, the 1.1 million that I just said is tuition only. If you factor in everything else, including high school, uh, nine through 12 and above, uh, as Vicki said, uh, Vicki, you said what, it's about th 3 million something altogether. And that's, um, you know, that's 30% of our budget right there. You look at salary and benefits for staff, and that's a very sizable portion. So then the, the next part of the pie is, uh, you know, the, the resources for instruction, facilities, technology, you name it. So then uh, that, that slice of the pie, of course, gets smaller and smaller because of, uh, especially because of the tuition costs right now. That's really what's driving it. In that tuition cost, Joe, um, the total tuition cost, that includes uh, Riverside High and BCIT. And if a student actually qualified for Pemberton or North Hanover, those special programs that they have, that's yeah, so included. That, that's so, included as a tuition, a tuition student. Some are right. out district special education, some are high school. Right. So what is the percentage of that tuition cost for um, the special ed? Uh, I don't say, have that wanna, number. Say, that, I, I that know you number, have that. Right? <laughs> I know you have it. I don't have that number, but I can, I can say that for pre-K through eight right now, I analyzed the numbers today. Tuition alone is $1.1 million, and that's 25 students. You include all the other services and transportation. That 1.1 million probably grows to about two million, based on what I was discussing with the CST. Then you have another million for uh, Riverside and and other transportation needs for out of district for general education, high school, that type of thing. So that's my estimate. I I can't swear by those numbers, but that's what the CST and I were talking about today. Child okay. Good, thank you. You're welcome. And so just, just to also let the group know that the child study team and I are exploring the possibility of developing programs in district for pre-K, K to two, three to five, and six through eight, so that we would be able to bring students back into district for special education programs. Now, this is, this is a challenging task, especially considering the current situation with COVID-19. So for the past 10 months, uh, that's been a hindrance. But no matter what, we are, we are moving forward with various plans. Uh, they were ideas, you know, we, we developed plans and now we're moving forward. It just, you, we need to have everything fall in line when it comes to these programs, uh, including uh, working with the parents and the students themselves, working with the current placements 
uh, having our child study team members observe and evaluate, uh, and so on and so forth. So it, it is a number of steps to make that happen. But out of those four options of different programs, I mean, I, as I said during our board meeting, I, I would be satisfied with one. It's better than zero. Right. But at the same time, you have to look at the needs. So we could have two students that have autism. If one is in kindergarten and the other is in seventh grade, they're not going to be in the same program and, and that wouldn't make sense for us to have them in district in the same program. It, it just wouldn't work. Uh, likewise, if you have two third graders and one of them is hearing impaired and needs to go to uh, school for the deaf, for example, and you have another third grader who is uh, multiple, uh, has multiple disabilities, including Down syndrome or something, right? That's not an appropriate placement to put them together in the same program. So just because they have the same disability doesn't mean students should go together. And just because they're the same age doesn't mean they go together. So when we look at that group of 25, uh, we, we are challenged by that because of just the, the varying ages and needs of the students. But we are, um, we're putting a plan together to, to, to make something work rather than having zero program. So do you have a plan to contact the legislature and the governor to, uh, or do any of the other communities that you can join with or the Burlington County Educational Association that you can appeal to them because we're so underfunded for these special needs that um, is something being done in that regard? Is there something that we can do to help you uh, appeal to that? Because that, I mean, that really has to be done. They need to provide these municipalities uh, with, with more funding. Um, I mean, there's certain things that are mandated, but they're not funded. Um, and, and I mean, we have it in town that certain things are mandated, but they're not funded. And I just wonder if there's some vehicle that you're using to reach out to, uh, to ask for it, to you know, make some demands or to get some support. There are, um, actually, we've been involved in a group over the past few years that's advocating for fair funding for school districts uh, based on the legislation that took place uh, called S2 that changed the funding formula for districts. So, um, but then there, there are opposed, there, there's a group of districts that oppose what the group we're part of is doing because they benefited from the funding formula change. You, you know, yeah. it's, it's um, not everybody was impacted equally by the legislation changing, right? So you have group two, I would say two opposite ends of the table here are saying, well, we don't want to change the formula, we're fine. And then the other one's saying, well, we still need more funding, right? So according to the state, and this is something James has said over the years, officially they're saying that we are fully funded or even overfunded at times, according to the state. According mm -hmm. to us and our needs, we strongly disagree. And we have sent messages. Um, you could ask, you know, Mar Marissa has been on the board for a number of years. Uh, mm -hmm. We're still waiting for that response from the Department of Ed and uh, when it comes to funding. So it, it doesn't mean that we would give up. It's just, you know, we're part of a group. We have reached out. Uh, I, I just don't know, um, you know, if, if Delanco is going to receive additional funding that way especially now considering COVID-19, what, what we're doing is we're, we're receiving funding from other sources such as the CARES Act, the Co uh, Coronavirus Relief Fund, uh, ESEA, uh, Elementary and Secondary Education Act. So what, what's happening is the federal and state government are providing more support that way. And at the same time, uh, they did cut our budget, they, they cut our funding. So I, I can't remember what that number was, but you know, they, they it, it's, it was a situation in which we lost a significant amount of money, gained some back through these other uh, grant programs, but no matter what, um, we still end up with less. It took so away 115,000. Yeah. And yeah. then when they gave us the grant money, they really restricted us on what we could use it for. Yeah, so right. we had 115,000 unrestricted and then it was, okay, here's grant funding that you must use for such and such. I know it's early in your budget season. We will, uh, uh, what, go ahead, what was that, Mike? I know it's early in your budget preparation. What uh, what is your budget looking at right now? Uh, either in raw dollars, what you're exceeding pre last year's or percentage or, or 
what have you got right now? Very soft figures. I can't even give you that. We've I put stuff in there. I I there's there's no revenue numbers yet. They mm -hmm. they're not out until you know end of February. So. So you don't know where you are, but uh, is it likely that your your surplus, uh, the two eighty or the three eighty two, you'll probably exhaust that to to supplement your budget or? Oh, that's gone. That's yeah, yeah. We're definitely in the hole. Mm -hmm. We are definitely looking at at cuts. We've been cutting the past two years, mm -hmm. um, so that expenditures are at the bare minimum. We cut teacher supplies out, um, went to a supply closet. And so when they want a pencil, they have to ask for it. I mean, there's not Fine. really anything else that. Now, is there, does the state allow for school budgets that, that you can uh, basically bank or park funding uh, uh, even the though you don't, you don't have a need for it as far as a, a student or a mandate? In, in the anticipation that that may occur in, in a subsequent year, that basically a reserve. Do you have the uh, financial ability to do something like that or? The only reserve we have is a capital reserve, which can only be used for capital projects. We don't have any other reserves. Right. All right, uh, as I would suggest, uh, as you go through your process, if you can, whatever figures, and this will be confidential between, you know, the committee and board, just, you know, that we kind of know, get an idea of where you are uh, as we go through our process. And uh, we'll see as things develop with us. And, uh, you know, we're certainly keep an open mind on possibilities and, uh, you know, try to work on a solution here, so. Yeah, I'll try to get you a, a rough number by the end of the week. Okay. Where we stand, um, I'll have more discussions with Joe tomorrow and try to cut some more things out. And all right, and I'll get back to you. Any questions, comments from the committee for uh, the uh, the school board uh, administration and members that are here? Otherwise, we're kind of at the end of. Uh, uh, this hello. Week. This is hello. 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 Who is this? I can hear you. Harry. Yeah, this is Harry. This is Harry Litwack. Yes. Yeah, I was on a, uh, I represent the county and every, and biweekly we have meetings and it was, today's meeting was two uh, school board administrators, one from the Newark school board and another from a large uh, district, a K to eight district. And there really are only three ways that they were looking at addressing things, uh, having free balance, but that just creates a bigger hole. Uh, reserve accounts and general funds is what they're suggesting. And just so that it, it's really, I think, important to understand that the, the public law, 84142 of the uh, of the handicap in America, it's a federal law. It's not a state law. It's a federal law that everyone, states, communities, honors. That's why we have sidewalks, those new sidewalks that are for, for disability. We, we get federal money from that. But the state of New Jersey is only getting 18%, not the 40% that they're supposed to be getting. So it's a, yeah, we can address it at the state and we have been at all different kind of levels. Uh, the school boards association uh, and working with, there's a group of five agencies, NJA, school boards association that work with the Department of Education, with the governor, with the, the office and doing that. And also the citizens committee with Troy Singleton who serves on the educational committee. So it's not as if people aren't aware of it. It may be new or new information to the township, but the people within the educational community and everyone is uh, is suffering because of not knowing where, where the funding is coming from. And one of the things they emphasize is that everyone working together, uh, the, the board members, the townships, and um, 
you know, trust and, and, and verify and trust, but that the integrity of a of our school board administrators, um, that they're honest and they have integrity and it's collaboration and time that we need to kind of focus on. It's a it's a taxpayers in Delanco who have this problem. So we have to figure out how to move forward and have some long range um, financial planning as well. So that that's where I just got out of what I just caught the last 15 minutes of this meeting. And that's any kind of information I can share that maybe can help us. So I, I'm sharing I that. Appreciate the input, Harry. I know you're, you've uh, been you're well. in the board rep to the, uh, the county school board association and at the state level as well, so. Yeah, yeah, there's a state meeting coming up uh, next Friday. So I may have more information as well from that. Any uh, comments from the committee so board. far? And uh, as far as the agenda uh, to discuss, or do you want to just absorb what we've got and uh, we'll continue to the uh, the next uh, next meeting after the uh, the February May through February eighth regular meeting as we continue our budget work. I'm good, thank you. All right, thanks. I'll keep feeding you more information, more capital, particularly the capital program and any stuff I get from the auditor. So, you know, prior to the February 22nd meeting, you'll have a lot more information. Okay. Anything else, thank you. Chris? I'm good, thank Don? you. I'm good. I'm good. We got a lot more to input into this uh, budget. So. All right. Mrs. Laura, anything for you to add? And uh, you're still on mute. And uh, I don't I'm not aware of any reason for an executive session, correct? No, not tonight. All right. Okay. Uh, if there are no questions, comments, uh, thank you. Appreciate the school board for attending and uh, listening to the entire uh, long, long process from all the major departments. Uh, motion to adjourn. So all right. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Thank all you. Favorite. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Aaron. Good night now. Good night. Good night. Good night.